Hi guys, uh, welcome to the Designate Operators Deep Dive Talk. Um, I think we've got to get started now, yeah? So, first off, my name is Graham Hayes. I'm a software engineer in the HP DNS as a service team. We develop Designate. We also run the Designate install that's in our public cloud at the moment. And we're developing the DNS as a service for the HP Helium private cloud as well. Hi, my name is. You guys hear me okay? Hi, my name is uh, Ron Ricard. Um, I'm a senior cloud engineer at eBay. Um, I'm responsible for DNS as a service within eBay. Okay, today we're going to go over. Um, Several things with you. We'll give you an overview of Designate. We'll talk about the REST API. We'll talk about Designate and Neutron. Um, we'll talk about Designate Central, and we'll talk about Designate Sync. Okay. Hopefully, you guys are all here because you want to hear about DNS as a service. That's uh, that's what Designate does. Um, we're hoping hoping it'll be part of OpenStack soon. Um, Designate consists of uh, a REST API, Central, and Sync. Those are the, the three main pieces to Designate. Designate's communication um, shouldn't be a surprise to anybody if you've done any other OpenStack components. Um, it's all through uh, message queue, you know, Rabbit, RabbitMQ, for example. Um, this is both for its external communication, for example, between Designate Sync and Neutron, or Designate Sync and Nova. Um, internal communication is also uh, through Rabbit, and that's between Designate API and Designate Central, or Designate Central and Designate Sync. Um, Designate Client is available for you, which will allow you to manage the servers, the domains, and the records. And it's very important to understand when I say manage the servers, what we're really talking about is name service records, okay? And, and if you come to our uh, uh, workshop a little bit later today, you'll actually get hands-on experience with that, and that'll become a little bit clearer to you, hopefully. Um, more functionality is available, though, for you in the REST API. Okay, so the client is, is a subset of the, of the API, but there will be more functionality available in there for you. It's important to understand a couple things as we go through these slides. Um, designate is the source of record for DNS records for the domains that it manages, okay? So, if you're an admin, maybe you already have some heartache about that. You just heard me say that, and you're like, ugh, that's fine. But uh, Designate is the source of records for, for the domains it manages. Um, domains are owned by tenants. That's also another important concept um, in Designate. Uh, if you want additional information about Designate, we do have read the docs out there. Um, you can go out there and uh, get more information about it. So as we're talking, a lot of this stuff is covered in the read the docs. If you need more information, maybe, maybe, maybe I wasn't clear, Graham wasn't clear, go ahead and read about it, okay? I do wanna point out before uh, we get on to the next slides that I'm gonna use the word domain, and I'll probably, you'll probably also hear me hear, use the word zone. Um, there is a distinction between a domain and a zone. I understand that distinction. Most of you guys probably understand that distinction as well. Um, when it comes to designate, though, uh, there is a one-to-one -one mapping, uh, at least now there is. Uh, between a domain and a zone. So it's okay if I use the word zone where I should be using domain and vice versa. Plus, if you're from Keystone, I believe they have a concept of a domain as well and probably confuse you. So, okay. Cool. So this is the basic architecture for Designate. Um, probably the easiest way to run through how it works is to run through a user making an API call. So in the bottom left there, you'll see that the user makes an API call into Designate API. It authenticates the token against Keystone and then puts the uh, request onto the message queue. This gets picked up by one of the central nodes. Um, and depending on what's happening, it'll, it'll either go to the database and get the information it needs, or it'll write to the database. And then it sends the information to the back end. Now, a backend is what manages your DNS servers, and that bit's entirely pluggable. So at the moment, we support a couple of DNS servers, but it's easy, very easy to add new DNS servers in the future just by writing a pluggable backend piece. And that's really part of central, but because it's pluggable, we make it a separate piece in an architecture diagram. 
So once the user has, say, created a domain or, or created a record, they can then query it directly to the DNS server <coughs> through the side channel. So we have two entry points, really, for people to one for inputting information, which is the API, and one for getting the information back, which is traditional DNS. OK. So the Designate REST API has um, matured over time. Version 1 uh, provides the basic functionality for you. It allows you to manage the servers. And again, when I say servers, I'm talking about name, server, name service records. Um, it allows you to manage domains, the zones, and allows you to manage records. Um, ex we have an experimental version 2, which adds additional functionality. And again, this, this functionality is not captured yet in the Designate client. Um, but it'll allow you to do things like um, import and export zones, um, manage your top-level domains. Uh, it'll allow you to manage your zone blacklists. Um, and it also has uh, information in there related to Neutron, which um, allows you to work with managed floating IP pointer records. Um, and there's another link for you, all, again, on the read the docs. I, I've, I've mentioned the designate client before. Um, Again, if you come to the presentation a little bit later, workshop, you'll get a little bit hands-on experience with the client. If you don't come, think Keystone. Keystone has a client. You're able to type Keystone, give it some command, does some things. Designate client works the same way. Nova, if you've worked with Nova, same kind of deal. And again, the functionality is a subset, just to reiterate, a subset of the uh, entire Designate API. Right now, it works with servers, domains, and records. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the new features in the V2 API for the next little bit. So the first thing we've, one of the first things we did now at the moment is the ability to import and export bind nine zone files from and to designate. So we've implemented this with uh, just content types. So if you make a get request to a zone with its ID, you will get back a bind nine compatible zone file, which you can put into a server somewhere else if you like. For the same, the same way, you can import a zone file. If you have a huge amount of zone files you want to import and to designate for the first time, you just push them up with a text DNS content type, and it'll load the zone and all the records into designate for you. We also have a zone extractor tool, which was written to allow people to generate zone files. If, say, if you have a very complex setup for buying nine zone files, this will collect all of the zones and put them into easy to manage zone file form, uh, individual zone files for loading into Designate. <clears throat> In the V2 API as well, we allow you to choose what top level domains you want users to be able to use as part of Designate. By default, it's wide open. If you have no TLDs specified, it's, you can use whatever you want. But this is for people who are running in a, in a public cloud situation. This means you can assure people only register legitimate top-level domains. Um, and because it's an API, this can be done on the fly. There's no need to write out a, zone, write out a config file and reload the API and centrals. You just, your support guys can keep adding in new top-level domains as they become available. Um, we have some sample data in there, which was up to date as of a couple of months ago. But the, zone file, uh, the top-level domains keep getting created. So that's why part of the reason it became a, a REST API endpoint was to allow easy management of it. We also allow blacklisting zones. So a zone blacklist is effectively a regex that runs against every single zone creation request. And this allows you to, set, to block people using particular keywords or patterns for registering zones. For example, in HP, .com, in HP Cloud, we try to limit the use of HP.com domains to internal users. So as part of that, the, <coughs> whenever a user makes his own request, uh, a creation request, we run these regexes against it and make sure that it's valid. It's important to note, actually, for the blacklists and the top-level domains, if you had a customer that really wanted something and had a legitimate business case, for overriding the two checks, if you have, we have it's all it's all a policy based f uh, setup, so you can allow your support staff or your admins to create the zones on their behalf. 
if they if they need it, and then then they'd be able they'd be able to use it like any other zone uh, if it had passed the creation checks. So this, <coughs> what we have in Neutron, its new functionality in the last three or four months, is we allow people to manage pointer records for their floating IPs in Neutron. This means that operators can just delegate the entire reverse zone for their floating IP pool into designate and not have to worry about dealing with user requests for, manage, for, for creating pointer records. So currently, the way, we have it, the way it's designed is when a user makes a request for a, floating, for a pointer record, we go to Neutron and get all of the floating IPs that they have. So this means that users can only set pointer records for, for IPs that are in their tenant on Neutron. So I'm going to run through example calls for that. You probably can't read that, but this, for example, when you, do, when you first do a GET request to the root of the floating IP resource, you'll get a list of all of the floating IPs that you have available. And if any of them have pointer records set already, it'll show up here as well. So this is, if you get, this is a single floating IP record. So we have the address. We have the PTRD name, which is what will be the pointer record that gets put out onto the DNS server. And we have then the ID, which is built up of your region and the floating IP ID that Neutron provides. So that's just a simple get to the floating IP address. You can then post or patch, make a patch request with demo 001.example.io, and this will create the pointer record in designate and on the DNS server. So, that, so after this call now, that pointer is live and it can be queried. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about more, uh, more, more about um, what, what does designate central do. Um, it's important to understand that um, when designate was architected, the API was actually um, written in such a way that it doesn't do any work per se. It's just it's just uh, it's just a front end, a facade um, for for the, for the work. Most of the work and well, actually all the work happens in designate central. Um, it's the it's the core location for 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 the code. Um, it works in a plug-in fashion. Uh, there's a plug-in for the storage, um, SQL Alchemy. There's plug-in for the backend drivers. We have PowerDNS and SD4, free IPA, Red Hat's free IPA, Dynect, and Bind9. Uh, it is important to note though that the Bind9 needs some work. <laughs> okay, so if you were interested in implementing a backend driver, it's actually fa fairly trivial to do. Um, I've done it um, for eBay. Uh, you just need to be able to create, update, and delete TSIG keys, uh, domains, record sets, and records. Now, with that said, um, while it was easy, it's actually going to get easier. Um, in, in Juno, uh, we are going to be introducing a concept of mini DNS into Designate. Um, mini, DNS, D, mini DNS will be used to push data using zone transfers. Um, I believe in Juno it'll just be AXFER, but afterwards um, incremental zone transfers will, will, will come along. It's going to simplify the backend drivers even more than they are now. Uh, we won't have to deal with um, uh, the record creation anymore in the backend driver um, or the record sets. Uh, you'll just have to deal with the you know, the DNS server's specific way of uh, creating domains and, and probably TSIG keys. So this is the, uh, a simplified architecture that will be in place once mini DNS is being used. So now, so w when this is in place, this will allow, the backend driver will only have to deal with creating a zone and deleting a zone. Every time that a user tries to update a record or d create a record or delete a record, central, de uh, designate central will tell many, de will put the information into the storage layer, and then it'll tell the backend manager, which all it does is once it gets an update, 
it'll send a DNS notify to your DNS servers, the ones that you have serving customer requests. So what they do then, so they can just then do an AFXOR, so which is a zone transfer from mini DNS and get up to date. One of the re major reasons we did this, we were looking at doing asynchronous transfer and asynch asynchronous zone creation and record creation. And we were coming into all sorts of problems with uh, being consistent and ordering. And then we realized that DNS already has this solved. This is AFXR is, is solved, solves that issue. So that's the, one of the major reasons we have MiniDNS. It'll also allow a lot of future potential development uh, as we go forward. Okay, designate sync. So uh, we talked about designate API, we talked about uh, the second piece, designate central. Designate sync is the third piece of um, the designate architecture. Um, designate sync was written um, for you, the customer, or the user of Designate to um, meet your business needs, okay? So what it's gonna do is it's gonna consume events from Nova Neutron and potentially other services, and it's gonna turn those events into DNS operations. Um, what events um, and what operations are performed are determined by custom handlers, which are plugins in the DNS sync. Designate sync is going to ship, uh, or, or ships with two um, plugin handlers, which are, they're good examples, but whether or not you're gonna be able to use them, it's kind of dubious, but uh, uh, there's a Nova handler and there's a Neutron handler. Um, in both cases, what they, they're, they're tied very much to a single domain, um, and they allow you to add an A record into that, into that domain. So like I said, but they're great examples. It, 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 um, they're there to show you the simplicity of actually writing a, a custom notification handler but you probably will end up um, writing your own. Okay. These are the example of the kinds of events that um, you may get from, your, from, from, from other um, OpenStack components in the environment. So you've got your events that come from Nova. Looks like we got some events from uh, Trove, some events from Neutron. Okay. I don't know if you guys can read that or not. It looks even small to me from up here. Uh, this, is, this is an example of, of the payload that comes in an event. Now, where the, why the payload's important um, is Designate Sync actually uh, passes that payload off to the custom um, notification handler, and then the custom notification handler, the, the piece that you, you will write, you can actually pull out data that you need to create whatever it is you need to create. So for example, um, you, uh, you fire up a VM, you start up a VM, you need it to create A and pointer records. Uh, the data needed to create the A and pointer records is right here inside this payload. You have your address, which is uh, one, of the, one of the bolded items there, and, you, and maybe potentially you're gonna use the display name um, as, as, the, uh, name of the, uh, as the label for that record. And so that's there in the payload. When you, when you extend the class, for the notification handler, there's only three methods that you have to implement. Um, and, 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 there, and again, it's very simple to do. Uh, there's, there's a method which allows you to, uh, to, to tell the handler or to tell sync which exchange topic that you're listening on or you're, you, you wanna consume. Um, what event types do you wanna consume? Remember the screen with the event types? What event types is this notification handler gonna, ha gonna handle? And then finally, um, probably the, the, the main code is the, is the process notification where, where you're actually taking the payload, maybe even the context um, and the event type, and you're turning that into, into something, some DNS operation. So for example, you're taking the payload and you're, you're creating an A record. You're taking the payload and you're creating an A record and a pointer record. Okay. With that said, um, I was gonna walk you through uh, how eBay is using Detonate Sync because because I feel it's important for you guys to understand that uh, this is probably the piece of Designate that you will um, need to do some work with. Okay, uh, hopefully the community will have provided a back end for you for whatever DNS server you have. Um, SQL Alchemy is going to meet your needs, and you're going to need to you're going to need to write a custom notification handler for your business. Okay, so. Um, I'm gonna go through this, it's gonna be a little bit complex. 
Uh, but what, what I'm kind of hoping that you'll get out of this as I talk about how eBay is using uh, Designate Sync and what our custom notification handler does, what I'm hoping you'll get out of this is the flexibility. Okay, the power behind this, this particular component in Designate is it provides a lot of flexibility to you as a customer to get Designate to do what you need it to do. Okay, so our initial design at eBay, we took a very simplistic approach. Um, it was very granular. We had, um, we had tenants, and we had, we had a single forward domain and a single reverse dom domain associated with those tenants. And again, remember, tenants own domains and designate. We took the context from uh, the notification message, and then we created the A and pointer records for, for our VMs. As the VMs were created, we deleted those as the, as the VMs were deleted. Uh, it turns out, turns out that that was a little bit too simplistic for us. We need to make things more difficult. Um, and I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Uh, we have a concept of virtual private clouds, um, VPCs, and, and, we have, and basically we have a production VPC, we have a, a dev VPC, we have an external VPC. Um, those are represented in Designate as tenants, okay? They're special tenants though. Users are not members of these tenants. All the other tenants where users actually are creating VMs for are members of these tenants, okay? When I say members of these tenants, they're associated with these tenants. These tenants own the domains, okay? And they, may, and they, can, they can own many domains. So we may have one tenant that has ebay.com, paypal.com, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and another tenant that owns other domains, both forward and reverse domains, okay? In order for us to, to determine which, um, which zone we're going to uh, add the record for when a VM is created, we're using Nova's instance metadata, okay? So when, when, um, when you fire up a VM, we pass the zone name, we pass the host name, and we pass the VPC name um, in the, in, as metadata inside of the message, inside the message, and that's in the payload. Now it's available at that point to the code that I'm writing, the notification process code, or the process of notification code, and, um, and I can take that data out, and then I can determine what my A record's gonna be, I can determine what my pointer, uh, pointer records are gonna be. Now, the only, the only thing you probably need to understand there is because we, we have VPC names, and then we have tenants, there may not, there, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the name that we get in the metadata and the tenant, that's actually in the configuration file for us, the designate configuration file, that mapping. So we make that mapping so we know what tenant we are. Then you just need a user because you know, a user needs to be in that tenant in order for it to add the A or pointer record. And uh, we have a service account for that. And that service account is a member of, of all of those tenants. So we have a service account that's a member of the dev, dev tenant, it's a member of the prod tenant, it's a member of the, um, the uh, external tenant, okay? And then that service account is used to, to, to create the end pointer records. Okay, so that was complex. Maybe, maybe doesn't meet your business needs or anything. But again, what I wanted to point out here is it's very flexible, um, the, the, the model that Designate Sync provides to you. You're gonna have your own business needs, okay? So you'll be able to sit down and design something that's, that's, uh, uh, that works for you. So Graham's gonna talk a little bit about another use case. So this is a sample handler for, it, 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 it's using a particular API that's about to be merged. It should be merged in a week or so. But this is a solution that would allow you to have per tenant z zones for, uh, for, your, for your users. So we're exposing a endpoint to the V2 API called options, which allow tenants to set key value pairs of options in designate. And this would allow the notification handler to get in the event and from the context it can tell what user it is and get the default domain value from our, from our database and then use that value to create the A record and the pointer record. So effectively, <clears throat> and this, you'll just see this here, I, ha I haven't done any other setup. This is just the, pro the process notification function. So we get, it, we get the domain ID from Central, which goes to the database and looks up the option for that tenant. We create the record set, 
for this for this in this domain with the right name, which could be the name of the host or whatever you decide you want the pattern to be. Uh, as Ron said, because it's you write the code for this, you can make the, you can make it as complex and or as locked down as you want. So you can give the users no options, or you can allow them more and more flexibility. So from this, we're just taking the name from the name from the payload and setting then the, the floating IP address as, the, as a record in that record set. And then sending it off to central, which will publish it live on the DNS server. Um, it's a very, this is a very simplified example, but it shows how easy it is for you to write a powerful uh, function that suits you and your business case. Something like this would probably be more appropriate for a very large private cloud or a public cloud. But this could be set up to, for any use case, really. So just a reminder, we have a workshop today. It's in B314, in, uh, which is upstairs at half, half one. Uh, if you're coming, can you make sure you have Vagrant and VirtualBox? And if you're on Windows, an SSH client. Um, we found out that if you don't have SSH installed beforehand, it, it gets a bit screwy. But if, you're, if, you, if you've heard anything you're interested in or you want to see this in action, we're doing a step-by-step -step live install at half one, so please do come down. Yeah, so you'll get a, you'll get a live install. Um, you'll, you'll actually get to see the client. We'll use the client. We'll, we'll, we'll touch briefly on uh, the REST API. Um, and how to use the REST API, but then we'll, we'll, we'll dig right into the client. You'll get some examples of the client, and you'll also um, see sync in, sync in action. Specifically, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna exercise the, um, one of the default uh, notification handler that's, that's there, the, the Nova one. So you'll get to see a VM get created, and you'll see the A record um, get created in the DNS backend, so. Cool. So are there any questions? Um, Please, if, if you could, go up to the mic, give us your name, maybe who you work for, so we can determine, or we can direct our ire or uh, admiration properly. <laughs> hey, uh, my name's Richard, I work for Virtual Stream. I got a couple of questions. Uh, first, uh, is there any support, or anybody working on Horizon support yet for, for the API? Um, yes, we have Horizon support in HP Public Cloud currently. And as soon as we get incubated, we'll be open sourcing that, hopefully. And it should be up in the community then. Uh, what about uh, DNSSEC? I didn't hear any, I wasn't sure what, uh, is anybody working on DNSSEC uh, for the API or, or uh, Horizon or whatever? It's on the roadmap. It's, it's on the roadmap. We, we've talked about it. Um, it won't be coming in Juno, but it is on the roadmap. All right, and last, uh, so the interactions between uh, designated neutron, like when you specify a network and you can specify the DNS and or the, the search parameter for your solve.conf, like right now, every tenant has to have a, you know, DNS mask is everybody the same uh, resolve.com search parameter because it's specified at the global level. Any way of being able to have any kind of interaction between Neutron and Designate so that Designate can take over some of the, the, the creating the proper DNS conf on a per tenant basis or anything like that? Um, we, we've been talking with Neutron a bit, but we, we're trying to, de de designate is mainly aimed at being authoritative DNS, not, re not recursive. Um, I know there is, we are looking at integrating with Neutron, but not quite in that way yet. Um, I think there's, pro there's probably a scope for that to be fixed in Neutron. I don't know how much integration that designate could do there uh, if we stay as a, a, a authoritative DNS. And last, uh, the when you talk about uh, it is designate hooked into like the salometer events, is that how it's like knowing yeah. when to create? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. That, that's exactly. Really, that, all the events there we're showing are salometer and, events. And you, and you expose you expose the events the same way you do in salometer. So for example, in Nova, you have to turn on the state change for VMs. You do the same thing for designate, and we'll actually show you that at the workshop today. Hi, um, my name is Kashi Ali um, from Risk Management Solutions. Um, so my questions. Uh, Actually, I think you answered one of them was that because you're an authority of DNS server, that means all your VMs or servers will still use your recursive. So in our case, Infoblox, 
all, you, all that Designate would do is pass the records to, okay, that's straightforward. Um, so you mentioned the CLI interface, which is great, like for Linux admin and whatnot, blah, blah, blah. We have a lot of Windows admin as well. And so what happens, is there any sort of web interface that they can use if they need to? Because obviously if that's going to be the authority, you need to make sure everyone's going to the same place and some people aren't comfortable with the command line. Yeah, we have a, a, a Horizon plugin, which is the web interface for okay. OpenStack. It's, it's coming. It's, and, it's coming, so. Yeah, and there's a REST API, so I mean, if you don't want to use the Horizon plugin, you can write your own GUI. <laughs> <laughs> Nuts. Um, <laughs> uh, the other question I've got is, does this require OpenStack in any sort of form? Can you run it standalone? So if I wanted to bring it in today, and we don't have OpenStack today, we're looking to bring it in, so it's like a phased approach. Can I bring this in today and you know write the plugin for blocks myself and carry on, or is the, it? Yes, you could yeah. install it today. You would currently we use Horizon or Keystone for authentication. Okay. So, um, but you can run it unauthenticated if it's in a private environment. Okay. You can run it unauthenticated, and you'll or need it's it's just simple middleware that runs on the API that processes HTTP headers and does something with it. In our case, it goes off to Keystone and gets a response. But if you want to, that middleware isn't particularly difficult. Okay. So you could you could implement something custom there. And so, so if I understood DNS, so that's the next question. So if I understood DNS sync properly, that's like the notification piece of designate. So one of the challenges we face today is with cleanup, where you tell, um, and I'm not saying this is Infoblox's fault, but you tell Infoblox to delete a record, and it deletes a record, uh, it doesn't delete the C names. You don't have to go back and delete the C names or any other subsequent records, and you have to make sure you check for every single possible you know, scenario. Um, so is that basically what DNS is about? So if I get a notification from Nova or any other sort of event, I can just trigger that to do the cleanup process. That's, that's, that's correct, because it, it's, it's customizable. You write, you write the code on what it does. So if you have A records and C name records to clean up, pointer records, it, you, you go ahead and write the code for that, it'll do it. Okay. You get the notification, it does it. So last question, um, maybe this might be slightly off topic, um, but I just want to see your view on it. So one of the most painful things I'm going through right now, and unfortunately I have to do it next week when I go back, which is why I'm asking this question, is about host name conventions. Now, you're, you're doing a DNS record thing here, right? And having a cloud and seeing what AWS do with host name conventions and working from a traditional enterprise and trying to make them go into a cloud and telling them that you can't have, you know, role, DC, cluster number, whatever you flavor you want in the host name because you've only got 15 characters for whatever reason, we're Windows and a Linux workshop, so that's why the 15 character limit. What does, does designate impose any limits in, in terms of what you can, so does it add, does it take only give you X number of characters because you're in a cloud-like environment, so that you can provide some sort of unique form? Is there any recommendation you can have? Or, or you know, any sort of ammunition you can give me would be great, basically. Um, we're kind of agnostic. We support the RFC uh, for hostname length anyway. Um, with the notification handlers, there's a lot of, there's a huge amount of information in there, but if you're 15 characters, it's going to be difficult to get that, all that information into a host name. Um, no, but I don't mean, I don't mean the meeting that standard, right? So my, my point is that to be in a cloud environment is very difficult to, if, you, if you're thinking traditionally in an enterprise yeah. and you're thinking, oh yeah, for example, I've got an SQL server, it's the first node in the cluster and it's in, you know, in Iceland and it's in rack 15 and to have all that and manage that, and create sort of some sort of database for me, that's crazy, right? Um, whereas this is why one of the reasons Amazon and I think, I believe, I'm not 100% sure, Rackspace have these unique IDs and then you use tags. So how does designate, from a, from a user perspective, how does designate enforce some sort of, if you're gonna, if it's for a cloud, right, designate's for the cloud, how do you enforce that people don't do that? Or are you just expecting them to manage that themselves? We, well, it, we leave it entirely open to themselves. Yeah, um, you, you can, uh, it's up to you, but if, if you have uh, requirements around names and you want to limit, uh, maybe not even allow the users to do that, the custom notification handler is there. You can, you can come up with your own scheme for how you want the names to be, or you can, or you can take uh, the data out of the, like I said, out of the notification event that, that the user enters, display name or whatnot, and use that. So it's really, it's really up to you. Everybody has their own, has their own way of handling this. So uh, designate isn't okay. imposing Bye. anything on you. Right. So. I, I can go into more detail, but I've got people waiting. And I, if I explain to you what we do today, then you understand. Let's, well, yeah, so. yeah, let's go ahead and take it offline. Yeah, you can talk grab about us it. At, grab us at the end. Yeah. Yeah, come on. 
So uh, my name is Anthony Vega. I'm from Comcast. Um, I have a couple questions about, uh, you know, we, we talk a lot about pointers and A records and C names. Um, do you guys handle quad A's? And to an extension to that, do you handle V6 transport for resolving as well? Uh, yes. Uh, if, if the host that's running on can respond to V6, we're agnostic. Uh, if your, your DNS server can deal with V6 requests, it'll work. Uh, quad A, yeah, that's fully baked, that's fully in there. Uh, as are V6 uh, pointers as well. Excellent, thank you. Um, to extend that, um, running your DNS server in perhaps a, a VM inside of OpenStack as an advanced services VM or something, would you be able to support um, actually pulling from Neutron and, and binding to a, a dual stack setup? Oh, like to a customer's? So the VM that you actually run the, yeah. the authoritative resolver on, uh, would you be able to support actually binding directly to that and pulling at, uh, data out of Neutron for setting all that up? We don't currently. Um, it's an it, interesting idea, though. Yeah. Um, we're open to ideas, especially around integration with other open stack projects. Yeah. Um, okay. I'd like Thank to you. talk to you a little bit more about that. Yeah. I'll stop by yeah. afterward. Thank you. Okay. Cool. Hi, Steve Pearson, HP Cloud. Um, does Central manage the SOA record for you, or do you have to increment that yourself, the, the serial number, I mean? It's all managed it's by managed. internally. Yeah. It's, it's done for you, is it? Yeah. So is it possible to create zones which are not RFC compliant? We don't think so. Uh, um, I hope, hope not. Just <laughs> if, if somebody has found a way, please tell us, we'll fix it. Yeah. Um, I've found all sorts of little ways of breaking it. For instance, you can have uh, a C name which coexists with another record. For instance, one, one problem I've had. It's very easy to miss those little things. I just wonder if you thought about uh, those. Uh, gone we, through the RFC. It's definitely blocked. Yeah, that's definitely blocked. Okay. Uh, C name with, with other records. Yeah, we did, we did block that. Good, thanks. Okay, any other questions? You mentioned some limitations um, in uh, support for BIN9. What is it? Is it advanced features or is it just basic functionality? Um, wow. Uh, <laughs> it, it's basic functionality. Uh, it'll be fixed in Juno with the mini DNS. Um, to make a long story short, creating records seems perfectly fine. And, and, and actually, it's probably, um, this is just a bug that we can fix now, and then when Mini DNS comes along, Bind 9 will just get better. But uh, when, when you delete a record, uh, it doesn't get deleted immediately. It waits for another change to occur, and then that record goes away. I noticed that, but it's a bug that we can fix. I think all of us were kind of hoping that we'd get the Mini DNS stuff going, and then all, all of that management stuff goes away, so. Any other questions? Okay, well I will, I, I do encourage everybody to come to the uh, next session. Um, it'll be a hands-on session. You'll get to see uh, what we talked about in action, so, okay? Cool. Thank you. Thanks, guys.